Greetings. Greetings. Father Mark signing on. Continuing the series on the late medieval, early modern papacy. Moving into the reign of Pope 201, 201. Pope Gregory the 11th, the 7th of the legitimate Avignon line, who reigned from 1370 to 1378. The conclave of 1370 consisted of 19 cardinals who took two days to arrive at unanimous agreement. They believed that they were selecting a member of the feudalism club when they chose the nephew of Pope Clement VI as Pope 201. His baptismal name was Pierre Roger de Beaufort. So Pierre is Peter, so another pope named Peter the sixth, for those of you interested, the sixth man, uh, elected pope, whose baptismal name was some form of Peter. Uh, Roger is Robert uh, de Beaufort, uh, B-E-A-U-F-O-R-T. He was indeed a, a stupendously wealthy member of the aristocracy of southern France. He had benefited from the nepotism endemic to feudalism, having become a cardinal at the age of 19 because his uncle was pope. Yet once elected, Pierre proved to be his own man, um, demonstrating this by not taking the same papal name his uncle had, but instead choosing a different, not keeping his own name because it was Peter, because uh, that, would, that would have been gauche, uh, but instead choosing a name Gregory, Gregory is a traditional name of reforming popes, so he was the 11th of that name, Gregory the 11th. <clears throat> it is, uh, uh, has often been written that Pope Gregory the 11th was nagged by St. Catherine of Siena uh, until he returned the Holy See to Rome, ending the Avignon residence, the Babylonian captivity. Uh, that, that, it, that, there is, that is not entirely untrue, but it is oversimplified. As we've seen from previous papal reigns, the situation uh, in Italy was just profoundly complex and dangerous. Uh, yet St. Catherine was instrumental in the return, but it was more in strengthening a resolution already made rather than pushing the Pope to do something against his will. Gregory XI uh, was French. He passionately loved France. He was entirely at home in that land where his family was of the highest class. But in his heart, he knew, and from his life experience as an ecclesiastic, he knew the damage caused to the church's prestige and freedom of action by its continued residence at Avignon within the kingdom of France. He, he made a private vow uh, as pope that, um, that he would return the Holy See to Rome before his death. He was uh, only 42 years old at the time he accepted election, so he believed he had plenty of time to do it. The first problem was dealing with the violent chaos in Italy that had driven the well-intentioned previous pope, Urban V, to abandon the attempt, even though he had physically returned to Rome, but ended up retreating back to Avignon. After the death of the soldier cardinal Albornoz in 1367 and the subsequent surrender of Urban V and his return to Avignon, House Visconti in Milan decided to make a move to dominate northern Italy. To this end, they seized control of the important Lombard city of Milan and then turned their attention to the wealthy region of the Romagna, which was part of the Papal State, the northeastern part of the Papal State on the, between the Apennine Mountains and the, and the Adriatic Sea. <clears throat> Not having at his disposal another cardinal like Albornoz to lead his armies, Pope Gregory instead called on a relative to do so, a layman, uh, the Duke of Savoy, uh, Duke Amadeus VI of Savoy, 
whose own territories northwest of Lombardy could easily become threatened by the expansionism of House Visconti. So he also had a vested interest in this. In 1373, a combined army of mercenaries paid for by the Pope, mercenaries paid for by the Duke of Savoy, and uh, along with them, attacked House Visconti. And here we see, yet again, uh, the baneful effects of the condottieri system. This war came to nothing because there were the, the free companies on all sides, mercenaries on all sides, and none of them had any interest in ending the conflict decisively. Many battles were fought, but neither army seemed to ever be seriously weakened by these battles. Pope Gregory and Duke Amadeus were eventually forced by lack of money to continue, uh, lack of money to continue. They were forced to make peace with House Visconti in 1375 after two years of pointless fighting and ruinous expense. Accomplished nothing. This demonstration of weakness by the new pope encouraged anti-papal elements in the city of Florence, in Tuscany, Italy, to make their own move for political supremacy, reasoning that if Milan could take over de facto control of Lombardy, then Florence could take over de facto control of Tuscany. To this end, Florence successfully weaned the city of Bologna away from the pope, uh, which it declared in 1376 in the form of a public secession from the papal state. It was this loss of Bologna, uh, the reconquest of which had been one of the few real achievements of the many years of fighting undertaken by Cardinal Albornoz, that broke Gregory's, Pope Gregory's resolve to return the Holy See to Rome. And he was just going to give up. His relatives, 11 of whom were cardinals, as well as many others, were persistent in working discouragement into his spirit until he came to believe that he really was the only person in the world who wanted to return the Holy See to Rome. And so maybe he should just let it go. It was at this point, when the Pope was in desolation and doubt, that St. Catherine of Siena walked into Avignon in June of 1376. She had walked through Tuscany, through Lombardy, though they were crawling with homicidal free companies. She had walked across the Alps during the spring thaw. She walked into France though the Hundred Years' War made it one of the most dangerous places of Europe. And she simply walked into the heavily fortified papal city of Avignon at a time when official ambassadors might be made to camp outside its walls for weeks. This 29-year-old working-class Italian girl walked to see a man whose lineage was so high that he was cousin to two kings. She did this because she had been told by an unimpeachable source that her Holy Father was in need and there was no one to help him. St. Catherine was born Caterina Benincasa in Siena, Italy on the 25th of March, the Solemnity of the Annunciation, in the year 1347. Her parents were Giacomo and Lapa di Benincasa, made their living as cloth dyers. So working class, uh, not serfs, uh, they were not tied to, to any estate, but they also were not landowners and they had no titles, so working class. Catherine was a twin. The other died shortly after birth. So depending on whether Catherine is considered the first or the second of the twins, she was either the 23rd or the 24th of what ended up being 25 children born to the Benincasa family though, as was characteristic of, the, of the, the time, half of the children died before adulthood. At the age of five or six, she received her first infused grace in the form of a vision of Jesus smiling at her. At the age of seven, she dedicated her virginity to God after receiving another such infused grace, this one in the form of a vision of Jesus enthroned in glory. 
She endured ridicule for her developing piety, including from her family, from her parents and her siblings. She coped with this by uh, spiritually, in, in her mind, constructing a monastic cell in her mind, a monastic you know, quarters in her mind, and she imagined that you know, her soul would stay there. It, whatever she was, her body was doing, her soul was safe in there. Uh, a monastic cell is not only a place of prayer and retreat from the world, but according to some uh, continuities of spirituality, it was also a place to endure mortification of the flesh and the spirit. Um, in practice, this meant that she kept her spirit in this in this place, even while interacting with others. On the many occasions when her, her family, siblings, and even parents would humiliate or mistreat her, she accepted this as mortification, uh, as a purifying sacrifice, just as she did fasting or sleep deprivation. At the age of 16, after years of precocious spiritual development, her parents wanted her to marry. And as we've seen, the feudalism marriages were arranged by the families. But this act would violate her private vow or virginity made nine years earlier. Her parents did not take such a vow seriously and instead felt that their culturally supported rights as parents to arrange the marriages of their children took precedence. To emphasize her refusal to marry, Katerina cut off her hair. Her family then embarked on a campaign to break her spirit by constant abuse, imposing on her endless forms of menial labor and denying her the solitude that they had by this point deduced was the thing she valued the most. Her internal refuge preserved her resolve intact, and she even received an infused grace, another one, this one in the form of a vision from St. Dominic as a, a, a consolation, a fused grace of consolation during this period. In the end, her fortitude was stronger than her family's desire to control her, so they relented. Uh, she was allowed to join the local Dominican tertiaries, after which she wore only black and white for the rest of her life, the Dominican colors. Even there, among the tertiaries, she experienced rejection and scorn because the local female Dominican tertiaries in Siena happened to be, at that time, uh, populated for the most part by widows, older women whose you know, uh, husbands had died, uh, rather than young girls who refused to marry. And so they were not welcoming. You know, they looked down on Katerina and said, well, you know, we paid our dues. You know, we married, we had children, and, you know, we endured until the, until the old man died. And, you know, and then we, you know, that we went into the church. So now you're just trying to get out of all that. Still, uh, Catherine joined and remained in this canonical state for the rest of her life. Uh, she never became a choir nun, so she was never cloistered. Three years into her life as a tertiary brings us to Shrove Tuesday. That's what they used to call the day before Ash Wednesday. So now we call it Mardi Gras. Uh, so Shrove Tuesday, 1366. St. Catherine received another infused grace. This time a spiritual espousal of Christ to Christ in which she received a ring on her finger that only she could see. This entailed a, a deeper participation in the suffering of Christ, which manifested in Katerina's life as chronic ill health, digestive problems, and physical pain, chronic pain. Four years later, in 1370, she began receiving a series of heightened spiritual experiences, which culminated in her mystical death. During this, she was shown hell, purgatory, and heaven. This experience provided her with spiritual insights into divine providence that she later included in, a, in a, her work, uh, the Dialogues. By the summer of 1370, this mystical death was complete, and Catherine was instructed to surrender 
uh, spiritually. She, you know, she received this internal guidance uh, that she had to, uh, an additional mortification was required. She had to surrender that which she valued the most, her solitude, and instead become involved in the world. This involvement began as a continuation of the mortification that was so much a part of her life. She began tending the sick and incurables, seeking out those with illnesses that left, left them physically repugnant and therefore more likely to be neglected in their final days. Over the next five years, from 1370 to 1375, there were two key developments in her life. First, her work with the sick and incurables brought her to the attention of pious-minded Catholics who sought her out for spiritual guidance. This resulted in the creation of a spiritual family around her, which included a, a priest who was her confessor, uh, blessed, now he's beatified, uh, blessed Raymond of Capua, a Dominican, uh, who lived from 1330 to 1390. And uh, Catherine had nursed him through the plague. He survived and, and he became devoted to her. Uh, and he actually wrote her first biography. And later he became Master General of the Order of Preachers, the Dominican Order. Second development in this period, her reputation for holiness and sanctity resulted in her becoming a respected figure among even secular leaders in Italy, just among, you know, just among Italians who, for reasons we've discussed many times, had become mistrustful of the official hierarchy of the church. This growing reputation enabled Catherine to act as an independent diplomat, so to speak, always seeking to make peace among the endlessly warring families, uh, the uh, noble houses of Italy, as well as the city-states and that much-tormented land. It was Catherine's cherished hope that she would be killed during one of these missions. Uh, so it would be a martyrdom since she was only doing this in obedience to a divine command. That this martyrdom never occurred, that she was never killed, she attributed to her own sinfulness, that she was not worthy of martyrdom. <clears throat> More than once, astounded contemporaries would record that she would just appear at the tent of a general in the midst of a battle, or she would knock on the door of a headquarters in a city under siege. She would pass through a region of a town during a riot, or she would just show up at a well that had been taken over by mercenary free companies, just sit down and talk to them for a while. No one knew how she passed by the guards. No one remembered seeing the route that she took. And when she left, anyone trying to follow her just got lost, got turned around and ended up having to go back. On the fourth Sunday of Lent in the year 1375, uh, Catherine received another infused grace, this one, the stigmata, uh, while in Pisa. During a period of prayer in the church of uh, Santa Cristina, she prayed that she might be allowed to endure the pain of the wounds of the stigmata without the wounds themselves being visible because she feared that the notoriety would, would be too great an attack, or too great of a uh, temptation against the virtue of humility. One of the figures with whom she corresponded during this period uh, was a was Pope was the Pope Gregory the Eleventh. There are six letters that have survived. She knew of his desire to return the Holy See to Rome, and she knew that the failure of his predecessor's attempt, coupled with the many other problems he faced, had discouraged him to the point that he, he had given up. Uh, and it was at that point, uh, with the loss of Bologna, that was the final straw that, that caused Gregory to give up. Uh, it's at that point, on June 18th, 1376, that we return, that the two, the two stories come together, Catherine and Gregory, when one of the most remarkable women in history walked into Avignon to provide comfort to the Holy Father. Having attained an elevated state of spiritual awareness, Catherine was able to perceive realities that others could not. When she entered the city of Avignon, uh, she later 
confided that, that she was assailed by the odors of hell. In particular, the odors of greed and envy. The reality then was perfectly clear to her. Her Holy Father was being suffocated, spiritually suffocated by these odors of hell. Her personal meetings with the Pope confirmed her discernment and what had been revealed to her in prayer. She made use of an infused grace of knowledge to push Gregory back onto course. She told him that she knew of the private vow he had made years earlier to return the Holy See to Rome. This vow had been made in silence during a period of personal prayer in conclave after his election. No one overheard it because he didn't vocalize it. I mean, no human could have overheard it. So Gregory then knew he was not only speaking to a holy woman, which he already knew by her reputation, but that she, in this case, was actually a messenger from God. They both left Avignon for the trip to Rome on the same day, September 13th, 1376. The Pope went by ship, Catherine went by land. Nevertheless, she was waiting for him when he made port at Genoa. And, of course, by this point, he was not surprised. And uh, the news was not good. Florence was in a state of total anarchy. Having seen the Pope's resolve to return was still firm, even hearing this news. Uh, She left to return to her own home of Siena, and Gregory continued on his journey, finally entering Rome on January 17, 1377. So after 72 years, the papal residence in Avignon, France, was at an end. Now, there would be later individuals claiming to be pope who resided at Avignon, but they were not legitimate popes. There were only seven legitimate popes who resided at Avignon throughout their pontificate, and that, was, that came to an end with Gregory. Pope Gregory would never see St. Catherine in this world again, But God was not yet finished with her. She devoted the years 1377 and 78 to composing uh, her famous uh, dialogue, the title of the the work, the dialogue. It is most often considered a work of mystical theology, uh, which it is, but it also contains infused knowledge of doctrine, such that it is quoted three times in the Catechism. Catechism uh, numbers uh, 312 and 313 on divine providence. Uh, Here's uh, the quote. In time, we can discover that God, in his almighty providence, can bring a good from the consequences of an evil, even a moral evil caused by his creatures. It was not you, said Joseph to his brother, who sent me here to slavery, but God. You meant evil, but God turned it to good to bring, to bring it about that many people should be kept alive. From the greatest moral evil ever committed, the rejection and murder of God's only Son, caused by the sins of all men, God, by His grace that abounded all the more, brought the greatest of goods, the glorification of Christ and our redemption. But for all that, evil never becomes good. Continuing Catechism 313, we know that in everything God works for good for those who love him. The constant witness of the saints confirms this truth. St. Catherine of Siena said to those who are scandalized and rebel against what happens to them, everything comes from love. All is ordained for the salvation of man. God does nothing without this goal in mind. That's a quote from the Dialogue, uh, Book 4 of the Dialogues, Section 138. Catechism 356, quote, Of all visible creatures, only man is able to know and love his Creator. He is the only creature on earth that God has willed for its own sake. And he alone is called to share by knowledge and love in God's own life. It was for this end that he was created, and this is the fundamental reason for his dignity. 
And here's an, another quote from St. Catherine. Uh, Dialogue, Book 4, Section 13. What made you establish man in so great a dignity? Certainly, the incalculable love by which you have looked on your creature in yourself. You are taken with love for her, for by love indeed you created her. By love you have given her a being capable of tasting your eternal good. Catechism, uh, number uh, 1936 and 37, 36, 37, it's on, uh, <clears throat> they're connected. 1936, quote, on coming into the world, man is not equipped with everything he needs for developing his bodily and spiritual life. He needs other things. Differences appear tied to age, physical abilities, intellectual or moral aptitudes. The benefits derive from social commerce and the distribution of wealth. The talents are not distributed equally. Then, just continuing, but another paragraph, uh, number 1937 of the Catechism, continuing the quote. These differences belong to God's plan, who wills that each receives what he needs from others, and those, and that those endowed with particular talents share the benefits with those who need them. These differences encourage and often oblige persons to practice generosity, kindness, and sharing of goods. They foster the mutual enrichment of cultures. And here's another quote uh, in the Catechism from uh, St. Catherine's Dialogue, Book 1, Section 7. I distribute the virtues quite diversely. I do not give all of them to each person, but some to one, some to others. I shall give principally charity to one, justice to another, humility to this one, a living faith to that one. And so I have many gifts and graces, both spiritual and temporal, with such diversity that I have not given everything to one single person, so that you may be constrained to practice charity toward one another. I have willed that one should need another, and that all should be my ministers in distributing the graces and gifts they have received from me. While Catherine was at work dictating these dialogues, uh, Pope Gregory had dispatched armies to restore order to the Papal States and the surrounding territory. To his great sorrow, he employed many French mercenaries, led by French cardinals, who resented having to leave the comfort of Avignon to return to the chaos in Italy. One such resentful cardinal was Robert of Geneva, a Robert of Geneva. He led an army composed of mercenary free companies from Brittany, that's in the far west of France. After a series of battles in Tuscany, Cardinal Robert conducted a, a massacre at the town of Cesena in February of 1377. This massacre blighted the papacy with the scandal of mass murder of a civilian population. Now, Gregory, of course, was not present. He had no idea that this was going to happen or that it was, didn't even find out it happened until long afterward. <clears throat> but since the army was operating in his name, he got the blame. When news spread, riots erupted in Rome as the ethnic hatred of Italian for French was never far below the surface. Gregory had to flee Rome for the more easily defended residence at Anagni. So he, he did not go back to Avignon. He went, he went further away from Avignon, Anagni South. It's in the kingdom of Naples. It was from Anagni on May 22, 1377, that Pope Gregory XI issued a condemnation of 19 propositions extracted from the work of an Oxford academic named John Wycliffe. W-Y-C-L-I-F-F-E. I've also heard it pronounced Wycliffe, 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 who lived from 1324 to 1384. John Wycliffe is the proto-Protestant of Western Europe in that he brought together, synthesized, and articulated, represented to the public in written as well as preached form, 
much of what the later Protestant movement of the 16th century would hold. Before covering him, one development must be kept in mind. During the Avignon period, 10 colleges and universities had been established throughout Europe in England, France, Italy, Austria, Bohemia. Bohemia is now the Czech Republic. These were secular institutions, not church institutions. And these secular institutions were established in continuity with the anti-clerical developments of lay academia in the context of humanism, which we covered earlier. Coming into existence while the Holy See resided in France and bearing witness to the malign effects this had, it was inevitable that, that the layman trained in these secular colleges would share at least some of the humanist prejudices against the clerical hierarchy. Even those scholars who were not anti-clerical freely discussed and condemned many forms of the abuse and corruption that characterized the church captured within the, within the structures of feudalism. Now, most of the men trained in these colleges did not live as professional academics. Instead, they used their education to seek employment in the service of secular monarchs or some you know, secular aristocrats, uh, dukes, counts, barons, uh, serve on their staff or uh, serve in the bureaucracies of some of the emerging cities. Uh, and many of those people, for their own reasons, were either openly anti-clerical or at least disgusted by the widespread corruption in the church. Human concupiscence being what it is, these monarchs and, and these, you know, the elites of society, uh, monarchs, aristocrats, uh, city leaders, never pause to consider their own complicity or that of their ancestors in bleeding the church during the entire feudal period. All that got repeated was the church is corrupt. Now this might be said by the, the same kind of people. It could be a duke you know, who sends two of his younger sons into the church and sends two younger daughters into the church. You know, yet he'll say, oh, the church is corrupt. You know, and it's, uh... All right, having said that, we can now return to John Wycliffe, the Proto-Protestant. Born in 1324 near Richmond in Yorkshire, it's in the northern region of England, <clears throat> Wycliffe came from the class of land-owning gentry. So um, uh, they were not considered nobility, and they, they did not have a title. They were not of the peerage of the realm but they were respectable. Now, though he would later revile church corruption as manifested in the context of feudalism, he did not hesitate to benefit from it. In 1345, he enrolled in Oxford University. In 1351, he was ordained a priest and endowed with a benefice for his support, which he collected the revenue from while continuing his academic career at Oxford. And that was one of the most baneful practices of feudalism, one that he would later condemn, even though he benefited from it. He, uh, he attained the, the status of magister, uh, masters, a master of theology in 1360. He came to public notice in 1365 when he began publicly arguing as a magister, you know, as a, and that, so that gave him public standing, uh, publicly argued that payments monetary payments from England to the Holy See constituted a form of submission to a foreign power and therefore were not obligatory under the natural law or the moral law. This brought him to the attention of a very powerful, well-connected man named John of Gaunt, G-A-U-N-T. He lived from 1340 to 1399. John of Gaunt adopted Wycliffe as his pet scholar. John of Gaunt was the Duke of Lancaster, third son of King Edward III uh, by uh, Philippa of Hainault. Uh, and because of that relationship, uh, John of Gaunt was also uncle 
of the later King Richard II. So Wycliffe is a member of the royal family. He's a Plantagenet. You know, even though he never became king himself, he was, you know, because he was a younger son, but he was still very powerful, very wealthy. <coughs> and Wycliffe is now on his staff, one of his retinue. Uh, Wycliffe con- uh, completed his education in 1372, attaining the rank of Doctor of Divinity. He wrote, now he has that status the, uh, of being a, a doctor. So uh, he, he, he wrote, published, scathing works condemning clerical, monastic, and papal corruption. In 1377, he wrote a work titled On Civil Dominion, in which he picked up the thesis that we covered in previous videos of William of Ockham and Marsilius of Padua, that the secular was superior to the sacred in authority, because the sacred, meaning the church, was dependent on the secular, meaning the state, was de- the church was dependent on the state for protection. Therefore, the church owed obedience to the state and was subordinate to the state. From, from this premise, uh, Wycliffe proposed that the king, he's referring to the king of England, but the logic would apply to the king of any country in his own country, that the ki- a king in his country has the authority by natural law to discipline ecclesiastics, including monastic and conventual houses, and, and including the regular hierarchy. And that if any ecclesiastics were corrupt, a king in his own country had the authority to suppress them, punish them, and do as whatever he wished with their resources. It was from this work, for obvious reasons, 19 propositions were extracted uh, by the Inquisition of Gregory XI and condemned as heretical, as the heresy of Caesaropapism. <clears throat> now, condemnation by a French pope for asserting royal dominion over the church in England was not a problem in, for Wycliffe in his own realm. and in, in fact, it only enhanced Wycliffe's prestige in England. Now, it would not have been safe for him to take a trip to Rome, but as long as he stayed in England, this only enhanced his reputation. The following year, 1378, Wycliffe began advocating for a vernacular language Bible, the Bible in the English language. In connection with his advocacy for a vernacular Bible, it's interesting to note that Wycliffe's patron, John of Gaunt, the Duke of Lancaster, was also a patron of Geoffrey Chaucer. It's uh, for those who, you know, it, it, uh, for whom study of the English literature was is far too, <laughs> far too distant in the past to refresh our memories. It's uh, Geoffrey Chaucer, that's C-H-A-U-C-E-R, lived from 1343 to 1400. An absolute uh, pivotal figure in the development of of vernacular English as literature. In fact, Chaucer's first literary work was a poem titled The Book of the Duchess. It was a tribute commissioned by John of Gaunt, the Duke of Lancaster, in honor of Blanche, his his wife, who had just died. In any case, Wycliffe and a group of like-minded scholars actually produced an English translation of the Bible. Now, this is not the King James Bible, because what these guys did was simply take the existing Latin Bible, the Latin Vulgate, and just translate that into English. And they did that in 1381. Now, this elevated his prestige even more, uh, bloating his pride. So he, he caused him to regard himself as a new Moses. And this, and this, this new you know, rarefied capacity, he, he pronounced that the sacraments of holy orders and confession were not biblically based, therefore were not really sacraments, that they were only invented later in the post-biblical church for purposes of political power and social control. Assertions of papal power, he declared, were false. Monasticism as a way of life was degenerate and not biblically based. Catholic teaching on the transubstantiation of the Eucharist was false. He taught that the specie 
the bread and wine remain bread and wine uh, while only only becoming figures figures of the body and blood of Christ he pronounced that the entire hierarchical system of the church was materialist and therefore not of God he further asserted in continuity with ancient Manichaean uh, dualism, which was reformulated, as we saw, as the Cathar movement, the Albigensian movement in the previous century. Uh, he continued that, arguing that God ordained a spiritual church, not a material church. To Wycliffe's mind, the omnipotence of God meant that God already knew who would be saved and who would be damned from birth. Uh, that, that, you know, therefore some were predestined to be saved. Uh, uh, and and the, the others, the foreknown, were to, were to be damned. Wycliffe's attacks on the sacraments then brought him to the attention of the church. The ranking prelate of England was the Archbishop of Canterbury, at the time a guy named William Courtney. So he became involved. In 1382, he, just on his own authority as archbishop, condemned 24 propositions from Wycliffe's work uh, related to the, the sacraments and ecclesiology. But because Wycliffe had John of Gaunt, the Duke of Lancaster, as his patron, Wycliffe did not suffer <clears throat> the way other guys, you know, in this situation might have been hauled before the Inquisition and, you know, tortured or executed. Uh, so nothing happened to Wycliffe because John of Gaunt still protected him. Wycliffe did, however, suffer another way. He uh, had a stroke, uh, suffered a stroke, and uh, became paralyzed. And uh, he had, had more than one stroke, and he died of one, uh, finally a massive one, two years later in 1384. So Wycliffe's placement as a forerunner of the Protestant movement is clearly merited and based in his own writings. Because of the large number of colleges that had emerged in the early modern period, Wycliffe's works were copied and widely distributed, so widely that they made it all the way to the other side of, of Western Europe into Bohemia, which is now the Czech Republic. There they were read by Jan Hus. That's J A N. H-U-S, Jan Hus. We know this because Hus included lengthy verbatim quotes from Wycliffe in his own writings. Now we'll encounter these teachings again and we'll see what, what happens to John Hus uh, later. But with Wycliffe, another step toward the Protestant movement had been taken. Remember, nothing just happens. You know, Martin Luther did not just you know, put up the 95 Theses in 1517 out of nowhere. You know, nothing just happens. <clears throat> uh, so with Wycliffe, the steps that he took amount to a complete attack on all essential aspects of the church had been publicly made in, the, in a Catholic country. England was still a Catholic country then. And the person making them had suffered zero consequences because he was protected by secular power, protected from church authority by secular authority. It is of interest to note that in May of 1381, a tax revolt erupted in England, in Essex, spread across, started in Essex, and it spread across England, came to be known as the Peasants' War. The, now, there were a number of conflicts in European history called that, so if you want to look it up, you always have to include the date. So the English Peasants' War, 1381. The spontaneity and violence of this revolt revealed how angry the lower classes were with the inequalities of feudalism and the legal status of serfdom. The revolt was suppressed militarily after two months of, of vicious fighting. Uh, but the leaders... Uh, became he folk heroes to the English commoner. These leaders were John Ball, Watt Tyler, and Jack Straw. In terms of Wycliffe and his anti-clericalism, this revolt makes it reasonable to infer that much of his support derived from an ambient 
anti-authoritarian attitude that naturally gravitated to such sentiments being defended by a man who was not of himself of the nobility. Pope Gregor XI died on March 27, 1378. So far, he was the last French pope. He was followed as Pope 202 by Urban VI, in whose reign Satan would make another international attack on the church, leading to the Western Schism from 1378 to 1417. So we will um, uh, cover that next uh, in a separate next video. So for now, thank you for your attention. This session is adjourned.